As a kid, I really liked buildings, really liked landscapes, really liked the grit of a place. I don't think I ever thought I could be an architect because I was thrown out of school repeatedly. I have no O-levels, GCSEs, I have no A-levels. And I was repeatedly told I was unteachable. I left school when I was kind of 15. I have nothing, I have no qualifications. The first recession, kind of way back, the end of the 80s, I'd kind of wound up my construction company, gone to Australia, and my eldest child, who's now 26, 27, had been conceived, and I knew I needed to get my life together, and I wanted to go back to university to study something. But I went to university in Sydney, and the first semester was a combined degree. It was graphic design, industrial design, fashion design, and architecture. And in that first week, there was a lecture by Glenn Merkert. In that one hour, I was given a roadmap for the rest of my life. It was like there was a language I could use to kind of make sense of the world. let it off now, watch out in case it moves backwards. Okay. Okay, so now we just have to I'll tighten that and we'll do it again. But it worked that worked basically. It was I think when I bought this place that um, this site for where, where we live about 16 years ago that um, I realised that I could have, a, I could have a, the life that I kind of wanted in Sydney, which is I could live in a bit of bushland that was close to a city and yet felt like it was in total wilderness. And I could live and work in a way that made sense to me. You know, we designed had a completely enclosed sort of thing. So it was a sort of funny half acre slot of woodland, you know, with a view and bought a funny old castellated building that was on the site that was sort of fallen down. No one wanted to buy it. We bought it for a tiny amount of money then. You know, it was the price of a one up, one down end of terrace in our local village. And we lived there perfectly happily for two years. Built a house ourselves because didn't have much money and we built a house having to carry everything down the track. Every single component was carried down the track by hand. Built this ourselves as a sort of way of understanding how buildings went together. At the back of my mind for a few years before 2010, I'd been looking for a way to set up a much more autonomous organisation. But I got back to Australia with my family and reconnected with the people I'd studied with. And there was a moment before Christmas when my practice copied me into their corporate Christmas card that they were sending to all of my clients. You know, and I felt physically sick that this vision I'd had for practice suddenly had morphed into this organisation that was sending out corporate Christmas cards. So I very publicly extracted myself from my old practice. You know, when I came back from Sydney, it was like my stuff was on the road outside the office. You 
you know, I sent out this letter that was a rejection of mainstream architecture that set out a vision for being able to work in a way that was in tune with my family, in tune with the place I lived, in tune with the natural cycle of creative work, which has to ebb and flow. And I didn't really set up anything else. I just started to work as Invisible Studio. I think it was when I built this studio that the practice really came together because the studio was built then with my neighbours who had never built a building before. They'd never picked up a saw. They'd never really cut a bit of timber. They didn't know what, you know, how a building went together. And I wanted to build a building for less than a year's rent, which was my old office. The vision I had was the vision that was really given to me by Studio in the Woods. And Studio in the Woods is my friends coming together and doing stuff and then disappearing. And I'd always call Studio in the Woods an invisible studio. Mm. Oh yes, that's some sort of platform to view it. <coughs> yeah. The other thing is you've got three different groups. Piers phoned us up one day, a group of his architecture friends, and said, I'm really frustrated, I'm not making anything in the office, how about coming to my place for the weekend and we just make some stuff. There's another group that's doing that. So one group's finishing, one group's, you know, worrying about this, and another group's worrying about that. Um, so there's two lots of steam bending. That's the problem. <coughs> um, one bit of steam bending. Yeah, well this. So these, <coughs> that's a dowel <coughs> that goes through them. Yeah. So these, the implant has a dowel that goes through. Um, so we just auger, auger a hole. I think the experience of actually working in woods with timber, with the material of that place, and the constraints and possibilities that that enables or brings to a project, and how each of the pieces that we make in Studio in the Woods is very much informed by that, by the context and the material. That, I think, is very often at the heart of an invisible studio project. If you're an architect, people come to you for a professional service, and I think that could be really limiting and Invisible Studio doesn't fall into that trap because of the kind of flexibility that it affords. <clears throat> Maybe this will lead to other practices choosing to have a kind of more flexible way of working but it means people changing their kind of mindset from thinking that actually what architects are offering is design.
I wonder if Ted's managed to make it. Yeah. Are you using all of the rest of these bits of timber to start cleaning them up? Invisible Studio, in a way, has been a continuous collaboration with Charlie Brentnell, who I've worked with for a long time. Charlie is a contractor, or timber framer, and now we build buildings together as Invisible Studio, and Charlie will lead the construction, and typically I will lead the front end, although Charlie is involved right at the beginning as well. And we also build buildings with amateurs and unskilled people, which for me is incredibly liberating to be able to leave the world of construction and architecture and work with people that have no sense that you're doing architecture, or have no sense of how things are supposed to be. We're very different characters. Piers is very fast thinking, he's very immediate and bang, bang, bang. I tend to be quite the opposite. It's the tortoise and hare scenario, really. He's incredibly flexible. Uh, you know, so he'll have developed an idea, could be to quite a, an advanced extent. And if he sees that something's not working, he's um, very skilled at just letting go of something and doing a complete about face with it. And quite often we're working on things that we have no idea how we're going to build is the reality. There are times where we just say, look, let's just get the material and we'll twist and bend a piece to check whether something is physically possible and in a very quick and dirty way experiment with something. And that helps inform a, an intuitive process. You know, we never see material as a kind of inert thing that you just add to a building. It is the kind of lifeblood of a building. And historically, material has been demoted to something that sits below form. And for us, material is kind of super important. There's an emotional involvement that I do have to these homemade projects that is difficult to get in projects that we do for other people. It's very lovely to see this idea of a, of a building that doesn't have to be fixed and static as it was when it's photographed, when it was completed in all the magazines, but instead can change and develop and evolve over time. When I built the first project here, which was the house, um, you know, my circumstances were very different. I was young and we had one child and now four. And um, I worked for somebody else, you know, it was my first project that I'd done for myself. And I was very self-conscious about it and very deliberate about much of it. And in a way, it's a very kind of naive project. You know, when I look at it now, it's like a kind of A-level essay that is full of that youthful kind of self-righteousness. And uh, it's full of flaws, of course, as well. And um, 
over, you know, I, I kind of, with that project, I kind of hated it for a while. You know, did it, loved it. Then I gradually, as I grew older, I hated it. And now in a way I've become much more accepting of it. It is just part of me. I was young, I did it. It's a youthful project. And, and each of the projects I'm very bound up in, in terms of where I was then, but also where I am now looking back at that project. As the projects sort of multiplied, and as we had maybe five projects, began to look back and realize that, in a way, my work isn't about a building. It's about a journey that started as a kind of voyage of self-build discovery in this world of making and timber and rural bodging, you know, some years ago. And, and they straddle a fine line between being something that a farmer might have built, you know, or something an architect might have done. And I think they, they kind of morph between those things. And I really like that unselfconscious ambiguity that it's not capital A architecture, high art. It's not just a farmer's barn, but it morphs around. My work is that journey. My work isn't a static fixed building or set of individual moments that get frozen and put in a magazine. It's a, this, this journey that is ongoing, really, this, this sort of journey of, of... They're almost sketches, these buildings, I feel. 